Hey everybody, Mark Callahan, Mr. Saltwater Tank here, coming to you today with part three of my Reef Junkie interview series. I'm here with Kate Rawlinson, who is a researcher doing some up-and-coming research about acro-eating flatworms. Now, for those of you who don't know what acro-eating flatworms are, I'm going to have Kate explain them a little bit in a minute, but they target SPS coral, acro-eating flatworms, acropora. They're not fun things to have, and unfortunately, we don't know a whole lot about them. There's Lots of rumors going around and flying around on forums, suggestions, but Kate is actually a scientist who's going to teach us more about them and let us know about some new research that she's working on as well. So Kate, thanks for being with me this morning. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a marine biologist at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, and I've been working on flatworms for the last 10 years. Wow. Um, and about four years ago, the acro-eating flatworm came to my attention from the hobbyist community and we described it as a new species and since then we found it in the wild for the first time. And um, I'm continuing to collaborate with reef hobbyists to try and understand more about this worm in order to control, control its damage in reef tanks. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about that today. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a great place to start because... I've been in the hobby a long time, you know, I remember when acro-eating flatworms were coming on the scene, so to speak, and people said, oh, you know, just dip them or scrape them off and you'll be okay, and now it seems like that might not necessarily be true. Tell us what we know that's fact about the worm so far. Well, we know that they're a type of flatworm, so they're not, they're not aceal flatworms, they're a type of platyhelminth flatworm um, that belong to a group called polyclads. Um, so we know exactly what they are. We've got a, it's got a it's a new species. We've got a new name for it, which is Amacusa planet acroperi. Um, we know that they eat about nine species of SPS acros, um, all of which originally come from the Indo-Pacific region, so from the Coral Triangle. Mm -hmm. um, they can wipe out coral colonies really quickly. So they eat the flesh. They take off the, the tissue of the coral. Um, they and they leave white scars exposing the skeleton underneath. So that's the first indication of an infestation of these worms. You see bite marks in the tissue and then you'll also see um, the eggs on the, on, the, on the bare skeleton. And then if you look closer you'll see them camouflage brilliantly against the coral tissue. Um, so we know that they, they eat the coral and that if left untreated um, that they can kill off the colonies quite quickly. Um, we also know from initial work that I've done that they're very, um, they've got a high reproductive rate, they're stuffed full of eggs um, and these worms are hermaphrodites so they just need another individual and they can mate um, and then they lay their eggs and they, each individual could probably lay hundreds, hundreds of eggs Yikes. Um, so that once they're in the system they're quite hard to get rid of um, and they, they hatch out after a given period and they're very tiny there, they hatch out at about the size of a third of a millimeter. Wow so that you can't see them with the naked eye and they go straight into the coral skeleton and start eating the coral tissue straight away. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so they're tricky, tricky things to work with. Now, a lot of us dip corals, you know, I certainly advocate dipping corals, especially SPS against acro-eating flatworms. Do we know if those dips are even effective? Um, we, we don't have any, we don't have any experimental, experimental data to show their effectiveness or not. Lots of these dips, um, Paralyze the adult worms, the adult worms fall off and then they can be removed um, from the quarantine tank. And lots of these dips, um, such as levamisole chloride um, and dips in freshwater and iodine based treatments, will eventually kill the adult worms. Um, but we don't have any quantitative data to show how long it takes and how effective they really are and whether some worms can actually survive these dips. Um, so that's, that's unknown. It's also unknown whether these um, out-of-tank treatments, so these dips, affect the eggs um, and the embryos inside the eggs. Um, lots of the dips will paralyze the adult, but whether the molecules of these dips can actually get inside the egg capsules and kill off the embryos, we don't know. Um, so this is, all, this is all information that would be good to find out at this point, because this is all, this is all unknown. Certainly, because it sounds like they're nasty boogers. I mean, I've dealt with them. They're not fun. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly how to eradicate them, short of you know, cutting off the, the affected part of the coral. I know a lot of coral wholesalers, when they'll get in um, a larger acro colony, right off the bat, they'll just hack off the bottom of the stalk in hopes that if, even if there were eggs, because they're very small, the juveniles, like you said, a third of a millimeter, I mean, that's 
super small. Yeah. Um, you don't want to risk it, so they just find it easier to cut them off that way in hopes that they're doing something. At the same time, you get a big acro colony. The last thing you want to do is go hacking that thing up because you're probably buying it, unless you're buying it to frag it out, you're buying yeah. it because of the size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And cutting off the bottom might be effective at getting rid of um, the egg capsules that are on the, on the bare skeleton, but there could be tiny juveniles hiding in the skeleton that are invisible to the naked eye. Um, and it's those small life stages there that would be impossible to see. And, and, and they're, the hard, they're the hard ones to get rid of because the, the adults you can see and fish can see them too. And as some people know, you, you blast it with a turkey baster, the adults um, float off into the water column and rats will pick away at them. Um, but it's the really small ones that the fish wouldn't see and that we can't see that we don't know whether they're there or not. And they're, they're really well camouflaged too. Speaking of fish, I know lots of people have suggested wrasses to eat them, Hovind's wrasses, um, you know, six lines might eat flatworms. We use them for other kind of flatworm eradication methods. You know, acro crabs have commercial acro poor crabs that live in there. Do we know if those animals actually eat the flatworms? We don't know this for sure, no. It's all, it's all anecdotal evidence from hobbyists saying, well, we've seen this wrasse eat them. Um, we, we can guess, like, knowing, knowing what other animals eat, we can sort of extrapolate and say that perhaps coral-eating crabs might eat them because coral-eating crabs, they eat the mucus off the top of the coral, so perhaps they're skinning off the, uh, the acro flatworms too. But we don't know this for sure. This has never been tested. Um, we don't know there's anything that actually eats the eggs of the flatworms. Perhaps there is. I've seen, working on other species of flatworms, I've seen marine snails eating flatworm eggs. So perhaps there might be some natural predators that we could use as biological controls, perhaps such as acro crabs or snails that would eat the eggs. But these are all experiments that I'd like to do in the future. I'd like to go out into the wild where we found them and carry out these feeding experiments. Because on, on corals, uh, on the reef, you get hundreds of different animals that live amongst the branches of corals. And any one of these animals could be, could be eating the acro worms. And when we found the worm in the wild, they were really abundant. So, so we went to Australia and we sampled 10 Acropora valida colonies randomly off the reef. And on seven out of the ten, we found the acro flatworms, which is amazing. And that, that was just by chance. So they're probably really abundant and really widespread in that area of the world around in, uh, Indonesia, Australia, all over the coral, coral triangle, the Indo-Pacific area. Um, but the interesting thing was that even though they, were very, they could be really widespread, the numbers were really low. On, on each of these seven colonies that we found the worms, there were only two or three worms per coral head. So something out there is keeping the numbers in check and stable. Um, and it could be the coral's natural immunity or it could be anything that's eating it. You know, there could be fish, it could be crabs, it could be snails. Um, and this is all work we'd like to do in the next few years. So it sounds like this might be kind of a natural parasite. I mean, it is natural in the sense you found it in nature, so it's there. Mm -hmm. we, we know it exists in nature. Maybe there's some level of it's always there and the, the coral can fight it off or some animal out there is taking care of it for the coral, that's something yep. we don't know for sure, though. Yeah, I think that's the case. I think it's, um, it's a natural part of the animals that live on the coral, but its numbers are being kept low. Where in the tank, and in the tank, numbers could be kept, co kept, could be kept low naturally, but if, if there's a tight shift in an equilibrium of coral stress or a natural predator not being there, all of a sudden, this worm can just go mad and eat, eat the acros, and it's just like a feast for it, you know? Right. Um, and that's, that's when the problems, problems arise for the, for the corals. Sure, you remove the natural predator and all of a sudden it's a heyday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this worm thinks it's, you know, it's party time. So we're learning more about it. You're a scientist. Tell me about the research you're doing now or the research that you're hoping to do um, in terms of experiments so we understand what, what's going to be going on with the research you're up to. So... Um, so as I said, I've been working on this, this animal for the last four years, and during that time I've had hundreds of emails from hobbyists asking me questions about its life cycle, like how long can it live without the coral, how long does it take to hatch. Um, and these are all questions that I don't know and I haven't been able to answer because I haven't got my own reef tank. But in the summer, a hobbyist um, called Kat Dybala, who is the president of the Marine and Aquarium Reef Society of Houston, contacted me and saying that she wanted to set up her own tank specifically dedicated to culturing the acro-eating flatworm. Um, okay. and so 
I know it's it's an amazing endeavor. And so she's been we've been in contact regularly, and she's set up these tanks and is um, culturing the worms and trying to answer some fundamental questions on the life cycle of the acro flatworm. Um, and um, at the moment, we're trying to raise funding for this for this project and for these experiments to try and answer some fundamental questions about the flatworm's life cycle. And we've raised uh, we've started a crowdfunding um, platform to raise money. Um, and this is on, under the website Microriser. Um, okay. And then you, you might have heard of um, pro, you might have heard of projects through Kickstarter, which is a crowd a crowdfunding platform. And Microriser is a similar type of platform, but it's specifically aimed at scientific research. So Kat and I um, have put out this project where we want to answer some questions about the life cycle of the worm, and we're trying to raise a total of five thousand dollars in order to carry out these experiments. And um, specifically, we want to answer questions such as how long does it take for the eggs to hatch? Um, do they hatch out as swimming larvae or do they hatch out as juveniles and go straight into the coral skeleton? And if they hatch out as larvae, then this could be a problem because they can swim around in the tank and they can swim to other tanks that share the same water supply and into the sump as well. Um, so we want to determine whether they're restricted to that coral or whether they can swim around your tank. Um, we also want to see how long it takes for the worms once they hatch to reach sexual maturity. So when can they first start laying eggs? And we also want to find out how long it takes to starve the juveniles and the adults um, so that when you remove your acro from your tank and put it in quarantine, if there are any stragglers in your tank, how long will it take for them to die off? Um, and then so when you put your acros back in your tank, you'll know that it's completely worm free. So these, yeah, these are all questions that we aim to address with the um, experiments that we're going to hopefully do if, you, if, we rate, if we reach our funding target. So it sounds right. like for now, we know some stuff about them, but not a lot. We don't know, I mean, we do know they, where they live in corals, we know how they live in nature, um, but we don't know for sure what can cure them, how do they live, how do they get around the tank, if at all. I know I've even talked to people that's where they've seen a flat, an acroidian flatworm swim across their tank against the flow in their tank and latch onto a coral. And I'm like, um, okay, um, <laughs> I don't know about that, but yeah. all right. <clears throat> um, yeah. well, well, that's the thing, it, it could be true. But, um, we haven't got any experimental data to say yes or no at this point. Right. And, you know, unlike other data like against ick, that in a way it, it indirectly filters into the hobby because a lot of the fish disease data is done in aquaculture. It's for aquaculture um, type industry. This is research that you're doing that's directly going to affect hobbyists. It's going to directly affect the tank, you know, behind us, those of you that keep SPS. And I mean, even to the fact that we don't know how it, how it lives, maybe it comes in on other types of coral by chance and it can affect intake. That's the type of stuff that we need to find out through your research. Absolutely. And this, the experiments we're going to run with in, in collaboration with CAT are just fundamental questions um, that will help controlling these pests in the reef tank. And I think by running these experiments, then we'll have lots of ideas about its life cycle. And then we'll be able to go to the hobby community and say, look, these, these are the facts. This is the, um, these are the experimental data. And this is how you can control the worm, given our current knowledge. Um, but then with that, with that knowledge foundation, then we can get loads of creative ideas from everyone about better ways to actually eradicate this worm, not just control it, but actually find ways that we can completely eliminate it from tanks. So you're hoping to get the science, get the facts, which is how I started this whole interview series talking to Richard Ross about data. You want to get the data, then you want to take it to hobbyists and say, okay, go try this data and let's just, you know, get feedback on it in a real world type of scenario. Exactly, yeah, and, and this is a way for hobbyists to fund the research that they really want. Um, these are the questions they've been asking me for the last four years, and I haven't been able to provide um, empirical data. I haven't been able to do the experiments to answer them um, in a, uh, with the science, with the facts behind me. But now, if they fund this project, then I can go out there with, kelp, with Kat's expert, um, expert help and we can actually provide some answers to these questions and then go forward on to the next step to actually try and find in-tank treatments and, and better ways of dealing with them. And with most sound science, it takes money to do that. It takes funding. I mean, I don't see the federal government funding a study on how to control acroidian flatworms in 
ornamental Aquaria. Sorry. It's a shame, isn't it? No, and I've already contributed to your campaign, and I, you know, I want to let people know that I'm doing this interview series as part of my once a year holiday sale, and any purchase that's made from now until the sale ends, which is at Christmas Eve, 11:59 p.m. Central Time, any any purchase that's made, I'll give 10% of the total purchase value cab cat to your research and if you've made purchases of my books in the past thank you and there's a link at the bottom of the screen if you want to donate directly to the research as well but I wanna I like that there's data that you guys are interested in doing this in a scientific method getting the facts and giving back to the community working with the community as well I wanna support that again any purchase made between now and the end of the sale 10% of it I'm gonna put right cat into your uh, funding campaign so that you can keep doing what you're doing because this is the type of stuff that we need certainly with other threats that are you know out there such as the suggestion of shutting down you know Acropora collection or you know bring it even in bring it into the United States some people want to do that well if that happens even if it doesn't happen we want to protect what we have we need this kind of data and this is the way to get it done absolutely yeah thank you for that generous offer and I think and um, this would be a great way to um, help um, you know keep keep acros healthy in the, in the closed tank system um, and cat has gone a long way already to set up some of these experiments so, and so we can carry out carry out replicated experiments and if you're interested she's started a thread on reef central um, just with regular updates of where she is um, but as you said it takes time and money and she has to keep the acros alive even though they're being eaten alive and so we need to she needs to constantly get new acropora colonies um, and, and a good system uh, in order to do the experiments, so um, we're trying to we're trying to raise five thousand dollars, and we've got nineteen days left to do it. Um, so far, we've reached forty-two percent of our funding, but we've got nineteen days to reach the rest. And I think if everybody who's interested could just even donate five or ten bucks, that would really help in reaching our target. Um, and then once we've got that money, then we can um, carry on the experiments and get lots of useful information to learn how to control these. Pesky worms. Right, yeah, because they're not, they're not anything fun to deal with. I know of plenty of tanks, people have just really just thrown their hands up in the air and they've shut down the tanks completely because we don't know even if you took the acros out, does that, it's a lack of food, kill them off. We don't know that type of thing. We, I mean, you put some, the only way to know is to, you know, informally experiment and put some new acro back in and see what happens. And you're like, great, there's my investment. <laughs> I hope for the best type of thing, but you're actually getting the facts Again, I want to contribute to that, you know, with the holiday sale and, you know, see what you're doing and certainly, you know, keep me abreast of how this goes. I know scientific process takes time. I don't expect you to have answers overnight. Um, and you got to make some trips down to Houston, eat some uh, Texas barbecue while you're down there, Kat. <laughs> <coughs> All my Canadian fans would say poutine is better, but I, I haven't <laughs> tried it yet. No, I'm sure it's not. And it would be nice to get down to Texas to get out of the Canadian winter, too. Yeah, well, we... It's, uh, it's definitely warm down here, so <laughs> yeah. if you can get a suntan and you can learn a lot about accurating flatworms, I'm all for it. This is the kind of data that I like. This is the kind of stuff I want to see in the hobby. Um, you know, keep us abreast of it. Congrats on the efforts. Keep up the good work. And again, this whole video series has been done with the holiday sale. 10% of any purchase between now and the end of the sale is going to go 10%. 10% of that is going to go straight into the campaign for CAT. And if you've already purchased my books in the past and you just want to donate to her campaign, there's a link there at the bottom of your screen. Certainly love what you're doing, Kat. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Keep up the good work. Keep me informed. And um, of course, and let's get you a reef tank because you got to have a reef tank if you're going to be doing <laughs> acro research. I know, but I'd fill it full of worms. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, well, it's, uh, you know, we got to do things in, this, in the sake of research. So Absolutely, yeah. Keep up well, the good you. work. Thank you very much.